Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohan Kanungo, and I'm super excited to be here. I want to thank the San Francisco Public Library for hosting us. I know many of you have been in the earlier sessions, and my colleague James and I are super excited to talk to you about how to save for college. So to kick things off, I'm going to talk about K to C, also known as kindergarten to college, but we'll also highlight some additional resources. I'll talk about CalKids briefly, and then we'll go really in depth about what is called 529 accounts, um, which is sponsored by the state of California, their scholar share program. If you're just joining, we will be recording today's session. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to go back. I'll share a little bit about k to c and also the Office of Financial Empowerment so you understand our mission. And we'll breeze through as much of this as we can so that you can also have time for questions. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat as we go. So let us know if there's anything that's unclear or that you want to revisit. Um, I'll talk about k to c as I mentioned, some of the benefits of saving with us, um, and talk briefly about CalKids and 529s, and then also let you know how you can stay in touch. So Kindergarten to College is an initiative part of the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment, and we're housed within the Office of the San Francisco Treasurer. And our mission is to convene, innovate, and advocate to strengthen the economic security and mobility of all San Franciscans. Kindergarten to College is one of the flagship programs, but we want to make sure that you're aware of other initiatives, including Smart Money Coaching, which I believe many of you have heard about. It's an opportunity to receive free financial coaching, if you live, work, or receive services in San Francisco, that includes being able to review your credit report, create a debt repayment plan, review your budget, lots of really cool resources. We also have Bank On, which is an opportunity to get connected to a safe and affordable checking account. And we champion a number of different pilots, including guaranteed income and work to help um, borrowers with student debt repayment. So check out the Office of Financial Empowerment in addition to K2C. And for the sake of time, I won't show you our video called A Future Worth Saving For, but later I'll drop this into the chat. I really encourage you to check it out. There's nothing better than hearing from the participants themselves about the value of a program like K2C. So what is kindergarten to college? So about 11, 12 years ago, we launched K2C. Um, Jose Cisneros, the San Francisco treasurer, started this. And every student in um, the San Francisco Unified School District gets a savings account opened in their name with an initial seed of $50. So now our oldest students have actually graduated, class of 2023. Um, and so we're super excited not only to have students save for college, but to get them their money for college. And why is this important? So research shows that just having a savings account in your name can increase the likelihood of you going to college. It can, it can also increase the likelihood of you graduating from college. And having an account matters more than just how much money is there. So small amounts of savings really help create what we call a future orientation or a college going mindset and culture. And it helps you as a parent or a loved one for a niece or nephew or even an older sibling to really encourage that sense of possibility talking to them about what they're interested in, what they want to do with their lives, and what impact they want to have. With k to c we have over 52,000 accounts with an average balance for those who've saved of just over a thousand bucks. And to date, over the 12 years or so of the program, we've helped folks save over $15 million. What I'm really proud about from that is that two-thirds of that $15 million includes money that, have come, that has come from uh, participants themselves whereas one third comes from money that the city has put into these accounts. So people are saving with these accounts. And some of the key features include not having any fees. There's also no impact on public benefits. There's different ways that you can save with the account that we'll uh, learn about in just a bit. This is a dedicated college savings account, so it's not a regular checking account. However, you can make withdrawals in case of a financial hardship. So the money that you put in, you'll be able to take out if by chance you're facing some financial emergency. And you're also able to view your balance online. And as I mentioned, these accounts are opened automatically for students. So if you have a student who just entered kindergarten or if you have a student who entered SFUSD in a later grade, then they started, in, um, they started uh, the semester in late August. 
Um, come October, November, that's when we're getting new enrollment data and opening accounts for students. And then we mail a welcome kit in the mail that has your account number with your student's name, a how to make deposit brochure, and you can get started with saving. And then we uh, send an activity statement uh, twice a year towards the end of the semester, and that details how much money you've saved, how much money you've put in, how much money the city has put in, and we repeat that cycle each semester. So um, look out for a welcome kit or activity statement if you have a student in SFUSD. Um, and this is what they look like. Uh, as I mentioned, it'll have the student's name, account number, and then the activity report is, is similar to what you think of as a statement you'd get from your regular bank detailing how much money is there. As I mentioned, there's uh, four different ways to save with K2C. You can actually visit a Citibank branch. Citibank is our banking provider. You can mail in a deposit. And in fact, we have prepaid mailed envelopes so that you don't have to pay for postage. Um, you can sign up for direct deposit. So if you have a regular payment um, from your employer um, or Social Security, you can have payroll make a deduction automatically that gets sent into that student's account. And you can also sign up for bill pay through your regular bank or credit union and have a payment sent automatically every month or one off with whatever frequency you like. Instead of regular interest, we offer what are called incentives. And some of these include a save now incentive for those who have just opened their account. So if you make a deposit of any amount, we'll give you $20. Every year, we also have a matching incentive that's up to $20, it's a dollar for dollar match. So if you put in a dollar, we'll match you a dollar. If you put in $20, we'll match you 20 bucks. And if you put in 50, you'll get 20 bucks. Um, we also offer a growth incentive in lieu of traditional interest that kind of functions like interest. And it's a small amount that gets credited based on how much money you've contributed to the account. And then every year you can register to view your balance online or just log in to view your balance online and we'll give you $20. So that's a way to build up your savings without even having to put in money of your own. Um, 20 bucks just by logging in, viewing your balance, having that conversation with your KO. We also do some sizable incentives, um, including our equity incentive. Um, this targets elementary school students in the Bayview and Mission District in first to fifth grade. And this is an opportunity for them to really build up to $500 in savings rather quickly. So in addition to the $50 that every SFUSD student gets, they receive an additional $150 seed. And then if they make a deposit of $5, they'll get $150 and they can earn that up to two times. So that's a really cool way to really build up your savings. And we also have a variety of different contests, scholarship um, awards. We even do some stuff with the library um, to award scholarships into students' accounts. Um, so there's a lot of ways beyond these few that we've highlighted that you can really build your savings. And in fact, we want to talk to you not just about KDC, because maybe you don't have a student in the school district. Maybe you live outside um, San Francisco County. Um, there's a number of different ways you can still save, and you're going to hear about that in a moment from James. But just to give you a preview, um, 529 accounts is a way that you can save with both K2C and um, what's called California Scholar Share. There's a number of different 529 providers, but um, K2C is sponsored by the San Francisco Treasurer's Office, and Scholar Share 529 is sponsored by the State Treasurer's Office. And we are really excited to allow you to have the benefits of both of these types of accounts. So maybe at some point when you save with K2C, you realize um, you wanna really maximize your college savings. Um, you want that balance to grow. You can make the decision to transfer that over into a 529, which is an investment account that allows you to grow your balance with um, several tax advantages. Um, and <clears throat> you can choose different investment options that James can help guide you through and explain more about. Um, but one of the cool things with K2C and ScholarShare is you can decide to save with both accounts, or you can decide to move your money from K2C over to the 529 and just keep saving with them. We're also really excited to talk about CalKids. Um, CalKids is a new statewide initiative launched by Governor Newsom in 2022. Um, and it's there's two components to it. There's a newborn component, and then there's an opportunity for low-income public school students. So again, this is California-wide. Um, so if you don't qualify for K2C, 
uh, you or someone you know might qualify for CalKids. Um, for the newborn component, every student, or sorry, every infant born in California after July 1st of 2022 receives at least $25. And this initial seed has actually been bumped up as of July 1st, 2023. Um, so I believe that's $100 now. And hopefully that'll continue in future years. Um, but there's some additional incentives that you can also earn by registering to view your balance to get some added money beyond that initial seed. Um, and then for low-income public school students, there's a range of an award between $500 and $1,500. Um, for that first year that this program was announced, uh, Ge Governor Newsom really went big. Um, and so any uh, public school student who qualified with the eligibility for being quote unquote low income uh, was able to receive this account from first to 12th grade. Um, however, every year moving forward, it'll be for first grade students. So um, if you have a student who just uh, started the school year in first grade, they will receive an account uh, letter in the mail come this summer um, if they qualify for CalKids. And some ways that you can qualify for CalKids includes um, essentially receiving free and reduced lunch, and that could be because of your income. It could also be, be because um, you have experienced um, homelessness or the foster care system. If you're a recipient of public benefits, um, if you have been identified as an English language learner, um, there's several different ways um, that you can actually qualify um, as uh, being eligible for CalKids. And so you can go to calkids.org to learn more and even check um, to see if you have an account. Um, we're going to be wrapping up our portion of the presentation with KDC um, in just a bit, but I want to highlight that um, for students who graduated, as I've mentioned, there's an opportunity for them to claim their money for college. So uh, we've already processed now over 1,300 payments to the class of 2023. Super exciting. Over a half million dollars has gone to students, and we distribute that money directly to participants themselves. They can decide how they want to spend that money best for them. Um, and they just go to our website, k2csf.org, submit um, a quick form. That's how they claim their money. They can get it paid to them via Zelle, check. Um, or uh, transfer that balance over to a 529 account. Um, you can use the money for a range of different qualified educational expenses. Um, and, you know, if you've, you know, pursued higher education, um, you know, if you've continued uh, your education, you know, there's a lot of different expenses. So even a little bit helps. Um, but you can imagine that $1,000 I mentioned that could definitely help go cover for a laptop or, um, you know, maybe some of the tuition and, and uh, book fees um, for a semester at City College. And as I mentioned, there's nothing like hearing from the participants themselves about the impact of a program. Um, and so you can hear, see here a quote from Talia. Um, we'll drop in a link again to a couple of those videos you can check out and also just see at k2csf.org. Um, lastly, we wanna make sure that you stay connected with K2C. Um, so follow us on social media, including Instagram and Facebook. We have a dedicated Facebook page. Um, we have uh, our team who speaks a range of languages. I speak Spanish. Our, uh, my colleagues speak Spanish, Mandarin, um, and Arabic. Um, so please don't reach out, you know, please reach out to us rather and don't hesitate if there's things you want to know more about. We have all of this information um, in, a, uh, in a range of languages up on our website. Uh, we also have a newsletter and YouTube channel where we host videos that you can check out. And lastly, this is how you can stay in touch. So check out our website, email us if you have any questions, or you can call 311 in San Francisco, and we'll get back to you. With that, I want to thank you, and um, we'll see if there's any immediate questions, and if not, we'll let James um, take it over. Awesome. Well, I'm not seeing anything come through quite at this point, but if you do have questions, um, I'll just ask that you use the Q&A box for that. Um, Mohan's still going to stay on this call to be able to speak to K2C and some, some Cal Kids questions. So if you have those, um, certainly reach out. And there's been a great job in sharing some of the information and the links on those programs as well that's already in the chat box for you. Um, but with that, I'm going to take over a little bit. And we are going to put together a small college savings workshop for everybody that's here today. Um, ultimately, very appreciative to <clears throat> the organizations that have been involved in making this program happen. I'm gonna switch my presenter view for us. 
Um, and for context for everybody that is here, ScholarShare, as Mohan had um, introduced, is California's education savings program. It's sponsored by the treasurer's office here in the state of California. And it is what, what is known as a 529 plan. Um, so today's workshop is going to be around covering typical common questions around trying to save some money for a child's education, leading you through different types of accounts, um, all the way to exploring some of the costs. But a formal introduction for myself is I am based here in San Francisco. I actually live in North Beach, which is where I'm, I'm coming live from. Um, <clears throat> but previous to my role here with the 529 plan in California, uh, I did come from the financial planning world, um, <clears throat> as well as operating as a retirement consultant um, for some of the big firms across the country. Um, when I was working as an advisor, we actually got contacted, the firm that I worked for, to provide workshops around the topic of financial aid and 529 plans for uh, students via those PTA and PTA groups. And, and it has been a, a huge catalyst for myself where I've learned a lot more about this arena than I ever originally intended to. Um, and it's been something that uh, on our end, we're incre incredibly passionate about. I'm hoping to share some of that with everybody here today. As far as our agenda and the topics we're gonna talk about, we're gonna start up front with just putting some hard numbers to what it actually costs to get a kid through school at this point. And for most people, this is not necessarily to scare you, but it is something um, that we do have to have some type of context to what those school costs actually look like. We'll talk about ScholarShare, ultimately as a fit for families, for people that are looking to save and invest for that kid's education. We'll go through the process very quickly about what it takes to get set up. It is incredibly easy and can be done fully online. And then if there are some people on this call that already have ScholarShare accounts, I'm happy to speak to some recent inclusions um, <clears throat> and, and I, I'll guess add recently added features to ScholarShare because there's some resources out there um, that for, for certain parts of the population that might be exceptionally helpful. Um, we will leave some time for questions at the end. So use the Q&A box as I'm going through. Um, and I'll just ask that Chris or Mohan can throw me some questions if something does come up and you think it might be the right time for it. Um, but if not, we'll tackle them at the end. Starting out and just looking at the average cost of college across the country. Now here in California, the average in-state school tuition for a higher education degree is right around $3,100 a year for that tuition. The big jumps that most people are familiar with is exploring out-of-state public schools or things like private institutions where that cost really does dramatically increase. That big jump to right about $28,000 a year for tuition for those private schools is really where people start to get very scared because it is an expensive lifetime goal for that kid to facilitate them getting their career started. But when we think about saving and investing for a kid's education, it's not just tuition that notably is one of those big expenses. Room and board costs, whether on or off campus, are estimated to be between sixteen and seventeen thousand dollars every single year that that student's attending that higher ed facility. So it is no question that student loans are an important mechanism on how families actually get a kid through school. Over half of graduates, actually, at this point. Um, graduate with some type of student loan balance. And it on average takes them over 15 years to pay down that student loan. Student loans in the past couple of years have been really a hot topic, um, whether in the workplace, at home at the kitchen table or anywhere in between. The truth is that student loans are quite simply, they're an important mechanism to get a kid through school, but they're not notably without side effects. A basic concept that we hit on very frequently in one-on-one -on -one ap appointments is the concept of implementing some type of systematic recurring saving strategy for the goal that you're working towards. Now, this is uh, obviously explored under the lens of education savings, but the example that you're looking at is the objective of saving $100 a month over the course of 18 years. Now, if you were to continue to do that contribution for all 18 years, and have a 7% hypothetical annual rate of return, your total account value at the end of that period would be right around this $43,000 mark. And this is just represents incredibly substantial progress towards a savings goal. But it's also gonna be important that we talk about how to be tax efficient with the savings that we're doing and understand that under the hood, these are investment accounts. And so oftentimes people will have questions on that portion too. Now, 
long and the short of this introduction here is we know higher education is expensive. I know that I'm not blowing anybody's mind by saying that. But the truth is that even saving small dollar amounts are still incredibly impactful. And Mohan had hit on that when talking about K2C and making education a reality and a conversation that's had at home. Now, regardless of how old that kid is that you're thinking about saving for, there is no point where it is necessarily too late. However, um, <clears throat> one of the aspects that is incredibly intriguing in my world is understanding the way that you save and invest for a kid and the impact that it has on the needs-based financial aid that they're eligible to receive. So overall, we're gonna explore a lot of these topics today um, in really an effort to try to build some acumen around these conversations and then try to give you some resources moving forward to do some more research or seek us out um, for a bit of help as well. Now, by far and large, my favorite slide in this entire presentation is this one right here. And this is because on my end, I take one-on-one -on -one appointment requests, I do group education and trying to teach people about college savings. And almost always families will come to myself or they'll oftentimes go to their financial planners and ask questions. Well, this is what I've been doing. Should I change what I've been doing? Or maybe you could tell me more about a certain type of an account. And the truth is, is all these jars that you see laid out in front of you are the most common ones that people approach us with questions about. Now, my goal here is to give you a basic introduction to these accounts <clears throat> and explore some of where their tax benefits really are under the lens of education savings. Now, my role here is not, of course, to be your CPA or to help you file your taxes. Um, but I will say that it is important that we understand the basics to some of the tax status of these types of accounts. Now, if we start on the left and go with the first one, a custodial account, um, what is oftentimes referred to as a UGMA or a UTMA, maybe um, more formally known as uniform gift to a minor or uniform transfer to a minor where minor plays a very important key word with these accounts, as they really are a way to make an irrevocable gift to a child that once they become an adult, it allows them to spend those funds however they'd like. These accounts are oftentimes used as a way to just provide some savings for a kid um, that they can later on tap for something that they might want later on in life. Now, in the past, these really have been used as a way to fund anything from that first car purchase to down payments on a first home, all the way to marriage, starting a family, and even beyond that, um, <clears throat> sometimes education. But the truth is, is that these accounts are not necessarily well designed from a tax efficiency standpoint for the concept of saving for a kid's education. And there's another hidden detail with regards to custodial accounts is that oftentimes these accounts based on the age and when you're filling out financial aid, let's say the FAFSA as an example, these are oftentimes looked at as student owned and controlled assets, which means they have a little bit more level of influence than other types of accounts for the needs-based financial aid process. Looking at the second jar, retirement accounts. Whether this is offered through the workplace in like a 401k plan or a 403b plan, or it's an individually established one like an IRA, the truth is that Retirement accounts are very well designed around their ability to accumulate and then distribute assets in retirement. And I, I'll take this moment to encourage everybody on the call to not unwind your retirement goals for the purposes of funding a kid's education. And this is ultimately because there's no type of a retirement bridge loan to get you into retirement and through retirement. It is those student loans that are an important mechanism, and they are a piece that are critical for most kids that are going through school. Now, the, by far and large, the most popular way that families will come to us to say, I've been saving, but I'm not really sure what I'm doing, is with a simple savings account. A simple savings account is excellent to protect your savings and to allow you to just mentally organize different buckets of money for a particular purpose. But there's a couple aspects that really with some of the changes in the past few years that have made these accounts um, a bit more intriguing when we talk about them for education savings. The first of which is that savings accounts, the, when you have that interest that's paid to you, now that interest rates are no longer completely at the floor or at the ground, 
is that any year you have reportable progress in that savings account, you're going to get a 1099 INT form because those earnings are taxable. Now, but the second part of this is that ultimately that savings account is really designed to protect the savings that you're doing. And it's a great starting place ultimately, but we're going to explore some of the tax benefits that do exist with 529s and covered L savings accounts in efforts ultimately to show you that there's more tax efficient ways oftentimes to explore saving for a kid's education. And so our final two jars here have similar tax status. Now, both of the accounts, whether 529 plans like ScholarShare or covered health savings accounts, sometimes called ESAs, um, allow you to put after tax money into an account, invest, and then any distributions that you take from that account for a child's education expenses or qualified higher education expenses are completely tax free. So they enable you to keep those interests, keep the interest and the earnings that you get in those types of accounts so that they go a little bit farther for higher education expenses. Now, with these two types of accounts, there's a few differentiating pieces that have really led to the growth in 529 plans across the country. The first is that covered health savings accounts actually have very strict contribution limits, and they also have income limitations. And furthermore, one of the small details that most families don't necessarily consider right out of the gate is that the funds in a covered health savings account actually do have to be spent by the time that child hits age 30. Now, for most families, this isn't what they plan on when that child is first born. But the reality is, is that that restriction sometimes is something people do bump their head against. With 529 plans, there's no type of income limitation and the contribution limits are extremely lofty, which really just helps provide very minimal guardrails for the purposes of funding a kid's education and there's no expiration date. We're gonna talk more so about within ScholarShare, how those different investment options work. Um, and ultimately it is something we wanna give you some knowledge about the way that California administers this program too. ScholarShare is a program is one of the largest 529 plans in the entire country. We have over a 20 year track record of helping families save, invest to ultimately pay for a loved one's education goals. We are over $13 billion in assets. The state program is huge, but at a state level, myself and our team is <clears throat> overseen by the ScholarShare Investment Board that is chaired by the California State Treasurer. Um, and, and so in doing so, us being one of the larger programs, we are also known as what's called a direct sold 529 plan. A direct sold 529 plan does not have any type of a sales load or commission within this account that is payable to myself or anybody else at the organization. You don't pay to process transactions, whether that's changing investments, putting money in or taking money out. Genuinely, the only cost is for the investment that's elected within ScholarShare. At a plan level, ScholarShare is half the national average cost of a 529 plan and less than a third the cost of advisor sold options. And when we talk about every single cost to saving for a kid's education, the most conventional example of a 529 plan being owned by a parent for the benefits of that future student is that when we wanna keep the doors open on need-based financial aid, 529 plans that are owned by parents do get some advantages due to the nature that the parent is the person in the driver's seat. Now, the maximum level of influence that a 529 plan can have on the needs-based financial aid process is 5.64% of the balance. And when those funds are spent, it does not show up as income when the parent owns it as well. So ultimately very important when we know that the financial aid process is the mechanism that students get access to federal um, subsidized and unsubsidized loans as well. So important that we are also um, being aware that this is something that we have to think about and making sure that those kids still have access to that financial aid when it's so important about how they can go to school with it. Now, thus far, I've been very calculated with using a certain phrase, and that phrase is qualified higher education expense. Essentially, what can you spend this money on tax-free? <clears throat> Now, at this point, even though the state of California helps this program exist, the kids themselves can go to any accredited school in the country, whether that's two-year technicals, 
that is vocational schools, trade schools, or things like apprenticeship programs, all the way to the other side of the spectrum, things like postgraduate degrees, law schools, as long as that institution is accredited by the U.S. Department of Education, those funds can be spent on higher education expenses completely tax-free. As far as the types of expenses, it's things like tuition, room and board, mandatory fees that are charged by institutions, and then out-of-pocket expenses even qualify for this as well for things like laptops or textbooks, all the way to printers and internet access. Um, really extremely flexible at this point in terms of what you can pay for when we know that not the only cost to get a kid through school is not just tuition anymore. Now, in talking about some of the what ifs that do exist, one of the most popular questions I get is what if I save for my kid and my kid doesn't go to school? Now, ultimately, what I always bring people back to first and foremost is the fact that 529s do not have an expiration date. So sometimes what happens, the kid wants to take a pause, jump into the workforce and then reevaluate. You do not have to panic. But for especially uh, households that have multiple children within them, there are, um, it is effectively an option to change the beneficiary on the 529 plan. Now, once again, the beneficiary refers to the future student. So if you have multiple kids and maybe one wants to be an electrician and the other one wants to go to law school, you can pick up some or all of that balance and move those funds between kids. Now, this does effectively let you change it to other eligible family members, but they, they do prevent it that it has to be a family member of the original beneficiary. Um, they don't let you basically just change it to somebody random walking down the street. And covering, um, I'm sorry, Moha? Yeah, actually, um, related to that, we had a really good question in the chat and hoping you can share more. Um, the question is, can I open a 529 account for a niece or nephew? Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up question to that is, what impact would that have on financial aid? So you talked about the impact of financial aid for a parent that opens a 529 account for their mm -hmm. child, but what about if it's another relative? Yes, of course. This, these are both very good questions. Um, <clears throat> so the first one, you can actually use a 529 plan to save for anyone. Um, as an example, I, I do it for my best friend and his wife who they welcomed their, their first child. So it's something that obviously I want to help them um, in any way. And I'm obviously passionate about it too. So the stars align, um, but you can really save for anybody, but the, the child does have to have a social security number or tax ID number. That is uh, the only thing um, that, that might be a preventative piece in some cases, but as long as you have that, um, then you can do that. Um, and now talking about owning 529 plans um, for, for purposes of financial aid. Um, at the end of the day, the predominant form that's used in the United States for financial aid is what's known as the FAFSA. Um, and my reference from before is that the FAFSA largely breaks into questions around four concepts or four types of assets and income. That is the parent's income, the parent's assets, the child's income and the child's assets. Now in doing so, the financial aid system has gone through a lot of changes over the past couple of years. There was an act that was actually signed called the FAFSA Simplification Act um, in basically you know, helping to uh, effectively try to reduce how many questions are asked, um, which is very helpful. But this is also where we've seen kind of an interesting change um, to 529 treatment. In doing so, if you are a, an adult outside of that household, notably that FAFSA really only cares about the parents and the kids in reporting that assets and, and, and income sources. So people outside of that household are not somebody that the FAFSA necessarily inquires about. Um, and at the end of the day, I will say for parents that are getting close to this enrollment, the, the biggest piece in terms of words of encouragement that I can, I can give to families that I wish they utilize more often is being an advocate for that student um, when they are enrolling and working with the financial aid office after you've gotten your offer letter as well. Um, that is something that a lot of people ask that question, but I would say it is something that more often than not, it is worth the time um, in, in terms of offering and asking questions about how they got to that number and the ways that they might also be able to assist maybe above or below that amount. Um, it is something that you, I really do encourage people to be advocates in reference to that. Chris. 
James, I'd like to add just one thing, and I put it in the chat as well. Um, oftentimes when I'm meeting with clients, um, I will suggest to the parents that they set up a 529 for their newborn mm -hmm. because it's a great way for friends, family, as you said, to be able to contribute. So not everybody has to set up an individual 529. Oftentimes the parents or grandparents will set something up and then anyone can contribute, which is exactly what we did with my nephew. Yes. And, and so I'm going to be talking, Scholarship actually uses a mechanism called UGIFT, um, which I'll, I'll touch on, on the back end here. I, I, I will just say, you know, I've had some really cool instances with this that I'll talk about. Um, but at the end of the day, anybody can make those contributions. And it's a very popular request instead of necessarily wanting to buy that kid one more additional toy. Um, it is something where people want to help. They want to feel that they're investing in that kid's education. Um, and it really providing the mechanism to do so has, has just been a huge win across, across the state and across the country for families. Now, those investment options in those 529 accounts, when that money goes in, it is invested. And there's a multitude of different options. I kind of, I like to explain this like sitting down at a restaurant and being handed a menu. You can order what you want off the menu. Um, you can ask for suggestions, um, which we'll talk about as the enrollment year options. Um, but there's really a multitude of different investment options with ScholarShare. Um, on the left-hand side here, there is a guaranteed investment portfolio. Um, this is a principally protected, um, I, I guess the, the easiest way to explain it is it's kind of like a savings account equivalent. Um, in doing so, this pays, it protects your principal and pays a fixed rate of interest that is locked in January of every year. So in the beginning of January this year, it was locked at 2.8%. Um, historically, the interest on these accounts has always been at minimum 1% and a maximum 3%. Um, now, interest rates have completely kind of ballooned in the past few years. Um, that has ultimately led to some questions in reference to that. But I will just say, um, if this is something that you're utilizing for that kid, keep an eye in January of what the New Year's rate is, because it is universal for that investment option until you get into that next following year. But for more of those market style investments, um, because you sit down at that restaurant and you have the menu, you can go through and divide up your contributions to be invested however you want. People that are comfortable with getting under the hood of the investment options, there's a ton of information on the ScholarShare website and during enrollment around these options to explore you know, whether it's overall allocations, um, underlying funds, or even things like fee and performance data. Um, it's all out there and publicly available. Now, by far and large, the most popular option is what's known as an enrollment year investment portfolio. Um, broadly across the industry, these are called target date funds, where there's a year in the name that's supposed to coincide with the year that the child is going to enroll in school. So it's a newborn student that's in the 2040 or 2041 enrollment year investment portfolio at this point would have a more aggressive allocation. And in doing so through time, as th that kid gets older and older, it becomes more and more conservative the older the kid gets without you necessarily needing to go in and make that change. You can always make those changes. You are allowed to change your investments within a 529 plan twice per calendar year per kid. Um, so it is something that you are at no point basically locked into something. Um, you get those two changes to utilize it as you see fit. <clears throat> now, starting in 2022, ScholarShare has also incorporated 13 different ESG portfolios for people that uh, do want to chase those socially responsible investment options. ESG, if you are unfamiliar, stands for environmental, social, and governance, which are essentially principles to filter out the types of companies that are invested into. This is offered both in the target date style or a flavor of the target date funds called the enrollment year portfolio ESG options. And there are standalone ESG options as well if you are looking to build your own using some of these options. They exist out there. There is no dollar amount minimum for any of the investments. So if you do want to mix and match on that, I, I didn't bring that up the last time. So I'll, I'll chuck that in here too. <clears throat> as far as who is eligible, this was kind of one of the questions that was posed. The main terminology on 529 plans in terms of the different roles that people play on them the first two big ones that you see here are account owner. This is the adult that's in control of this money. It is their account. 
for the benefit of the future student, the beneficiary. As the account owner, you also do get to designate a successor account owner, which is if you as the account owner do pass away, this is the next adult that's going to control these funds for your kid. And in reference to that other question too, we use what's known as U-Gift, where every ScholarShare account has a code to it that you can give that code to friends, family members, and they're able to contribute online without necessarily getting access to your account. It confirms the information about the account, the first name of both yourself as the account owner and the beneficiary, and then it can accept contributions just straight from a bank account. People can actually make one-time or recurring contributions in this mechanism. So if somebody else wants to do you know, $50 a month or something, they're absolutely able to do that. Um, and their, their contributions do not impact yours. Um, everything gets deposited in the same pot. And there are tools online to track who's been gifting what um, if you utilize this code a lot. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as account opening, I will just say this, my phone number is plugged here and my contact information will be at the end if you do have questions. Um, I am one of six consultants across the state. Um, to Mohan's, Mohan's point, um, we have multiple consultants that are bilingual. So if you need support or you feel more comfortable communicating in a different language, um, that is denoted on the website what languages the other consultants speak. Um, but the process is very quick once we get, get to the point where we're on the website and in front of a computer. That account opening is basically four steps. The first section is your information as the adult in control of the money. The second section is the child's information, the future student. That's where you'll need their social security number or their tax ID number. The third step is electing that investment. This is where it will kind of put you in one of two buckets where it will say the enrollment year concept or all portfolios, which will bring up the full menu to order what you'd like. And the first, fourth and final step is setting up your contributions. Now, there is not necessarily a contract or a required minimum outside of putting a dollar in the account. Um, <clears throat> and in doing so, you can really set up these contributions however you want, and they can change. Um, in a moment's notice, you can change your monthly recurring contribution or go in and slide some additional funds in if you'd like to. My contact info will be at the end. There one note here too is that if you have already used a 529 plan and you wanna talk about state program specifics or differences, I'm happy to talk with you about that as well um, to see ultimately if it does make sense to consolidate that or not, um, it can depend. <clears throat> now, as we're getting close here, I'm gonna look at chat um, in a few moments, um, but I will say for those of you that already have accounts or are just looking for some additional resources, um, some details on ScholarShare, and without a doubt, one of the most important things that you can do to make success towards that savings goal is to set up some type of recurring contribution. Now, oftentimes, you might have the option to contribute via payroll direct deposit through your paycheck. Um, but most popularly, people are pairing this with a bank account, and you can go in and make that consistent progress every single month as you see fit. There are ways to automatically increase your contribution levels annually if you want that pre-coded. And UGIFT is once again, our mechanism to collect contributions from other people. Um, I, I've personally helped people blow this up on poster boards for things like baby showers, graduation parties, or even just things like birthdays and holidays. Um, there's a lot of cool usage to this. There's not a requirement in terms of people needing to do it, but if they want to genuinely invest in that kid's education versus just sliding them some pocket money, this offers a way to do so and to do so securely. You can always check accounts online, follow us on social media for recent articles. We've done some, some quick hit videos on different topics over the past few years. Um, and the final resource that I wanna to touch base on that's on the ScholarShare website is what's known as the College Countdown. Now. For those of you that have kids that are getting close to that first year of enrollment, um, I will just say this, I hear this extremely frequently, it is a stressful time period. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of balls up in the air in the essence of getting that kid ready to start applications, to walking and navigating through the financial aid process, all the way to finally accepting and having conversations about the offer letters from schools. There are resources for all of those checkpoints to try to help you stay organized. And there's even a network of parents that also volunteer to answer questions in reference to those resources as well. One of the other websites that is that um, 
Chris, I believe has shared, and if not, I will say, um, we use from time to time internally is an independent website that uh, we have no tie to, which is called uh, savingforcollege.com. Lots of information on student loans, financial aid, and all the way to 529 plans like ScholarShare as well. Now with that, um, I'm going to pause here for questions and try to get myself caught up. But for those of you still on the session, phone or email is always great to reach me. The final link it will take you to an appointment scheduling page, um, where, which will let you book an appointment. It is tied to my calendar, um, as well as all the other consultants that are across the state that work on behalf of ScholarShare. Um, and especially, once again, if you're more comfortable communicating in, let's say, Spanish, um, you will see that denoted on which consultants are bilingual as well. Um, but with that, kind of shifting focus a little bit for questions, um, anything in particular um, that we saw as a theme here that I might be able to speak to, um, or are we getting close to, to wrapping things up? There have been so many resources in the chat. I hope that everyone knows that you can do a save chat by hitting the three buttons because there's just been a ton of resources. Mohan's been posting, the library's been posting. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. I, I don't think there's an outstanding question right now, Mohan, maybe you can um, raise anything if I missed it. I, I do wanna say as a certified financial planner, you know, I love the, the pieces that you hit about saving consistently. This is how we save for every goal, save consistently and broad diversification. And that means that those age-based plans are fantastic because they are going to glide along with the child's age from a more aggressive stock-based um, investment uh, portfolio to more bonds and cash as the as the child gets ready for college. And so, you know, I, I just always like to hit simplicity, consistent savings, broad diversification. Exactly. Chris is completely correct. Mohan, did did you unmute for something? Yeah, actually, um, I have a comment, but I I see a really good question from Maria in the chat um, that I think you could speak to, James. Um, the question is: Can someone open a five twenty nine account for themselves? Yes, they can. So it is it is popular, especially for people that have entered the workforce. They know that they want to go back. You can set up and start saving for yourself. No limitation there whatsoever. <clears throat> And James, earlier you mentioned that there's been some really cool changes with 529 accounts, um, thanks to some federal legislation. Can you speak to some of that? Um, I know, as you mentioned, that sometimes parents wonder about what if my child doesn't go to college or, you know, they may not go to a four-year university. And I think there's some really cool things that have come as a result of these policy changes. You, you are correct. So um, what Mohan is, is poking at here is what's known as Secure Act 2.0, which notably was... Um, signed late last year into this year that provided some retirement changes, um, but as well as had a, a pretty big milestone change in, in the 529 world as well. Um, and effectively, what has been approved is a mechanism to convert a child's 529 plan into a Roth IRA for them. Now, at the rule set that it, at this point has, has been communicated, um, it does not go live until 20, the 2024 tax year. But ultimately, for those like single child households where you, you've been planning for one kid's education and, um, and then you, you just want to make sure that you do have some type of a fail safe or you know, um, a way to pivot if that kid doesn't go to school or use all that money, um, the, the truth is, is that this new conversion mechanic is quite intriguing for those types of families. Um, and uh, just the rule sets at a high level that at this point is not finalized, I will say that right out of the gates just to, to make sure I'm above the board, um, is that the 529 accounts to be eligible for this conversion have to have existed for 15 years. You're going to be able to pick up up to the IRA contribution amount, take it out of the kids 529 plan and put it into a Roth IRA for them. And you're going to be able to keep doing this until you've had a lifetime conversion amount of up to $35,000. Now, at this point, these rules do not go officially live until the 2024 tax year. So there might be changes that do happen before then. But ultimately, um, I would imagine um, this is something that most families are pretty excited about as another basically backdoor to handle those what if scenarios, which I, I think is just quite frankly, a, a huge win for families across the country. Um, 
but uh, within that, I'm happy to, to answer questions uh, on that portion, but it is something that um, I would encourage people to, to do some research on as well, um, especially if you are one of those single child households. Awesome. I'm going to add there that uh, it is limited to the regular Roth contribution yes. each year. Um, so yes, read the details. There's a lot more there. And I think there was another question that was um, related to that about uh, the conversions for anyone or just those who like, what is the timing of this? Yeah, I'll, I'll so let you go through the details. I, I, I see David's question here. Um, <clears throat> it's not just people that opened after 2024. That 529 um, account opening date is something that's oftentimes tracked. And in doing so, the account has to be established for at least 15 years. Even if this means we get into 2024 and you've had an account for 10 years, it's still going to apply. What they're more so concerned with is that um, it has existed for 15 years, not just starting 2024, to be clear. You're very welcome. And James, um, I think Another strategy, right, um, is if there are funds that are unused, you can change the beneficiary, correct? You are correct. So you can change the beneficiary on that 529 plan to another eligible family um, eligible family member of the original beneficiary. There does have to be that family link, um, but it gives you enough portability that the most popular transaction that I kind of poked at was changing it from one sibling to another, but it does go a little bit farther. You can change it to things like first cousins and there's some mobility to get you around the family tree. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately um, that has existed for quite some time within 529s. It's this new um, retirement conversion, I'll call it, um, that has been the, the recent addition that's kind of stolen all the, 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 the glory and the fame, I guess. <clears throat> And James, um, I think there's been some cool things that at least uh, Treasurer Ma has announced in the last year or so, um, enabling 529s to also be used um, for uh, trade vocational programs. So it doesn't just have to be a four-year university. Um, and then there is an option, <clears throat> although maybe it's part of what you're you're also telling us, maybe there's some important details uh, to note around using a 529 to pay student debt. Is there not? Yes, there is. So the original SECURE Act is where we saw this first get introduced. Um, that's where we saw the additional possibilities to use a 529 plan to pay down a student loan for a kid. You can actually take up to a lifetime amount of $10,000 out of a 529 plan to pay down the student loan of the beneficiary of that account or a sibling, um, which is helpful if those student loans do already exist. Um, this same SECURE Act also provided ways for families to use it for um, technical schools, vocational programs, and, and things like apprenticeships, I believe was in here as well. Um, and then kind of the final additional inclusion that I'll talk about um, is that at this point, um, federally, you can take up to $10,000 completely tax and fe federally penalty free from a kid's 529 account to pay for private K through 12 tuition. Now, this is a special case scenario and almost every state has a special case of some sort. Our special case in the state of California is this one. Um, now, if you were to take that $10,000 and pay for, let's say, private education for a child um, before their, their college age, you would be able to take that $10,000 without federal tax or federal penalty, but at the state level, any earnings in that $10,000 or whatever dollar amount you pulled would be taxable at the state level as income, and the state does have a 2.5% income tax penalty. Um, my reference was that almost state, every state across the country has some example of this. Sometimes it's apprenticeships, sometimes it's private K through 12 tuition, or something else. The truth is, is that um, this is our weird scenario in California. I, I will just say that. Um, and so people's accounts really do go the farthest for uh, higher education expenses at this point. Um, but private K through 12 tuition is notably expensive too. Um, I, I, I will just say that. <clears throat> Thanks, James, for bringing that up. The, um, the other thing that I counsel people on is that really investments are for a long-term goal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having a greater than seven or 10 year time horizon is really important if we're going to be doing investing in stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. And so even if we didn't have this tax penalty for the state of California, there's a question as to whether a 529 savings plan is the right place to be saving for K through 12 anyway. 
So you, just just a couple of things to think about. It for me, I feel like it kind of keeps people in line, knowing that this is going to be a long term goal. Well, exactly. It it, it is definitely best um, best designed around the ability to to keep that long term perspective. And I will say, um, as Mohan had introduced um, Cal Kids, what we can really see is at a state level, um, the indications are number one: try to get more families thinking about higher education as early as possible. And because the 529s don't have distinct contracts to your contributions, trying to get families with young kids starting as soon as possible, which from a financial planning perspective, it helps you stretch out how long you have to save for and invest for, um, which is very helpful. So um, a lot of those policies, and and that's partly um, why we might see that K through 12 um, treatment here in California is really the emphasis is about trying to extend that timeline as much as possible because that tax-free growth in the 529 plan is really the in, in incredible tax benefits for, for school expenses that way. Um, but I hope that that makes sense. Awesome. All right. I'm not seeing any further questions. Um, I don't know. Do you want to close this out, Chris? Um, or is somebody else going to be more responsible for us? But I, I will just say, I'll, I'll say this first. Thank you all very much for jumping on. Contact information is there if I can help you or if your question, um, I'm, I'm sure Mohan's information has been posted in the chat as well uh, for follow-up questions that we might be able to assist anybody with. But thank you all for jumping on. I, I, I do appreciate you. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Um, and this has really been a great program. I, I'm just so pleased to be able to work with you, James, Mohan, always with the Office of Financial Empowerment. We are really blessed in San Francisco. And of course, the library, who has been just the most gracious partner over the years. We've been doing financial planning days for 13 years. We had one year off uh, during COVID. Uh, it's been incredible. Uh, it's uh, I've seen a lot of these same people in all of the presentations today. So, you know, hats off to all of you who have hung in there, you know, sort of been trying to drink from the water hose um, of or the fire hose of information about many things financial. Um, you've got some great resources there from the Office of Financial Empowerment, the Smart Money Coaching, uh, certainly uh, James and all of the ScholarShare folks who can help you here, plus all the resources that we've seen today. Reach out to the library if you'd like to get any of the resource uh, pages that were put together for any of the sessions. Um, thank you for joining and, you know, just thank you to all for being a part of this.